Thanks. My name is Julia Black and I'm Interim Director of the LSE um, and a Professor here in the Law Department. And on behalf of, of the whole of the LSE community, it's my absolute and distinct honour to welcome and introduce our guest, uh, the Honourable pa Paolo Gentiloni, who is obviously the Prime Minister of Italy. And very grateful to the Institute of Global Affairs here at the LSE and also to the LSE um, Student Union Italian Society for organising uh, this event this afternoon. And thank you, Prime Minister, for making time in this, for this event in what must be an incredibly busy schedule that you have while you're here in the UK. So we welcome you incredibly warmly to the LSE. We are very proud to have a large Italian community here at the LSE. We have 587 registered Italian students. Um, we have over 1,800 alumni. And we have um, about 180 staff, actually, who are also here from uh, Italy. And our faculty and our students are engaged in a range of projects with Italian counterparts, um, which includes um, the, the, the Link Campus, which provides training for the diplomatic community, and which was an initiative which was driven by the Prime Minister when he was Foreign Minister. So as you will know, Mr Gentiloni took office of the Prime Minister in Italy in December 2016, and prior to that he was Minister of Foreign Affairs. And in that capacity, he was instrumental for developing shared solutions to the migration crisis and leading negotiations on the future of Libya. And Prime Minister, this is an important year for Italy in many ways, not least because you hold the G7 presidency. And your visit to London comes at a crucial time ahead of the negotiations that will redefine the relationship between the UK and the European Union. And we're very fortunate, I think, to have you as one of the key actors in the negotiations here today to share with us your vision of the future of Europe. And we know full well how much is at stake. Um, we, diverse communities at universities, feel this every day, uh, particularly at the LSE, because we have a very high number of EU nationals both studying here and working with us. So the stakes are high, not only for universities, not only for the UK and other European nations, but also globally. And we all, as academics and students at the LSE and beyond, look to our politicians for a mutually beneficial outcome that allows for continued close collaboration with our partners and friends across Europe, which is based on our shared democratic values and interests. And we at LSE stand absolutely ready to help with any evidence-based research to inform the very complex political and economic processes which are to come. So before I invite Prime Minister Gentiloni to speak, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping announcements, as it were. So the Prime Minister will speak for approximately 20 minutes, after which we will have some time for Q&A. Um, and I will ask people to ask questions rather than make statements and to do so quite briefly um, and take questions in, in groups of three or, three or so. Can I also ask you to turn your mobile phones off um, and just remind you that the event is live streamed and those a hashtag for those of you who are Twitter enthusiasts is hashtag LSE Europe. So without further delay, I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, uh, for your invitation. Uh, well, it's a honor for me to, to be here. Uh, I know that LCE is a British institution we choose to be at the same time a global institution. Uh, one of my staff members was a professor here and told me that British nationals were a minority in his department. Such an institution is not only a British asset or even not only a European asset, it is an asset for the world. Being this the first public speech given by an Italian prime minister in the UK since the Brexit vote, I will begin from the Brexit vote. That vote cannot be questioned or criticized. It must be accepted and dealt with. But being frank, as friends should always be, I'll tell you that the Brexit vote was a sad moment for many of us. We believe that together with the British people, we could continue building common institution in the extraordinary venue of the European Union. And we were wrong. However, we want to turn sadness into positive and optimistic action. We know that meaningful 
and mutually beneficial relationship will find new legal basis to move forward. Our very first Prime Minister, Camillo Benzo di Cavour, spent eloquent words about Britain. I quote, the land where liberty found inexpugnable refuge. There is no referendum and no political decision that can undermine the brotherhood between our two countries and between our two people. The UK will leave the European institutions, but it cannot leave Europe. As Timothy Garton Ash put it, geography is not destiny. As in personal relationships, you can be together but apart, or apart but still together, end quote. I know that this feeling and this belief are shared between us and Prime Minister May and is widely shared across European countries. And this awareness will be the inspiring principle for our forthcoming negotiation. It will not be an easy negotiation. I think we have to admit this sincerely. There will be a lot to discuss. However, I believe that EU and UK will handle it as loyal partners. I do hope so. We will face a complex process and unexplored territory. But we can turn challenges into opportunity. Through this process, we will gain a deeper understanding of ourselves and we'll learn from each other. Bilateral cooperation will remain crucial along the process. But make no mistake, the EU framework is the only guarantee for a well-structured and sustainable agreement in the long run. We must enter the new phase of our partnership in the best possible shape and keeping the interest of our people at heart. As you know, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the European project does not enjoy great consensus lately. And I would say that more generally, long-term projects are not particularly en vogue today. There seems to be an appetite for reactionary short-term solutions to deep-rooted problems. Masters of illusions are at play across the world to exploit legitimate concerns and sentiments of displacement that derive from ongoing changes experienced by our societies. Despite the novelty of the internet, the largely still uncharted territory of social media, and even the sinister shadow of cyber espionage, we are not facing a completely new phenomenon. Populism has historically been a traditional response to periods of deep change and periods of insecurity. It is a response that ruthlessly exploits legitimate preoccupations and concerns. The difference between the populist approach and our reformist approach can be easily understood by reading again the motto of this university, rerum cognoscere causas, to know the causes of things. As reformers, we base our political actions, our choice and our words on the best knowledge we can achieve. Populists, are not concerned with understanding. They want to fix problem by fiat. And to support this illusion, they need scapegoats, experts, members of the establishment, or politicians to be blamed. It doesn't really matter. Identifying scapegoats will allow for short-term solutions that will not address any real concern and often will make problems worse. Populism thrives on democracy by using all the free spaces of an open society. We are seeing this in the development of fake news. But I'm confident on two things. First, you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time, as in the quote often attributed to Abraham Lincoln. And second, 
good democratic reform will be able once again to address the legitimate concerns that are feeding populism so that the latter will end, perhaps abruptly and hopefully soon. However, it is imperative for liberal and democratic politics to take the challenge of populism very seriously. This applies to my country, to the UK, and it applies to the EU, because the challenges we face, as usual in our history, are essentially the same. Let me now speak to the other side of the channel. The British people has decided on a long-term development plan, taking on considerable risk, and are now preparing to face the challenge they set for themselves. The European Union must understand the magnitude of the challenge and take it on with courage and creativity, and it must involve all its citizens in a profound dialogue. The coming 12 months will see important elections in a number of European countries, and we should all use this occasion to discuss about Europe. We have historically put a lot of efforts on macroeconomic convergence, and rightly so. However, we have overlooked the importance of political convergence, which can only be achieved through dialogue and discussion, and then votes and choices. I think that the real answers to the demand for justice, opportunities, and fairness that we can hear coming from different parts of our societies can be found only within Europe, in an open society. We are much stronger and much freer together. Our liberties are not only protected by holding together, but they are enhanced. Justice is enhanced. Progress is more solid and more equitable. See, even by just starting this debate, we can clearly see that it is a debate ultimately about values. We cherish freedom, justice, and inclusive progress. Therefore, these same values must be the metric we use to assess the progresses we made so far as European, as member states, but also as European institutions. There is no doubt that the long-term assessment of the European project is one of stunning success. The European community, and now European Union, has allowed for unprecedented economic progress and inclusive welfare across European countries. Our union has established peace in lands where war was the norm. The EU has more recently ingrained democracy and liberty and a new wave of prosperity in the eastern part of our continent. Clearly, we cannot afford to rest on laurel. The strong message we are receiving at present says that neither our governments nor the European institutions can be content with our short-term achievements. This does not mean that we have to overlook or ignore historical progresses. But politics is not about the past, politics is about the future. We cannot hide behind a bureaucratic answer because politics is and will be stronger than formalism. This is why we need to be ready to push forward. The Brexit vote has clarified once more that the issue is about different degrees of ambition. We have to move forward in a much bolder way with the member states that are willing to do so without entailing that different degrees means different levels of friendship or cooperation. This approach will allow all countries to find a place and a suitable degree of integration within the EU. We need a flexible, reformed, and united EU in which different degrees of policy integration can coexist successfully, making it fit for the future. This is what we want to achieve in view of the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Treaties of Rome next 25th of March, a union of these citizens and states. Some say that the propulsive force of integration that began 60 years ago is coming to an end. 
I am convinced that the force of innovation and stability embodied in the European project still has much to offer. But in order for this potential to be realized, we must do better. The Rome Declaration will be a great opportunity for many reasons. We need stronger economic policies, not to increase spending, but to give meaningful answers to our citizens. Europe needs to gain a more complete understanding of the damage that occurs when austerity is the only compass. And I am confident that we are nearly there. We need to explore bolder policies, such as a European unemployment benefit scheme. We need to extend policies that promote exchange and intra-European experiences for young people. We need to take seriously the concerns that our citizens that express and be able to transform their, them swiftly into policies. A better EU and a stronger Eurozone are in the mutual interest of the EU and UK. Deepening and the completing the governance system of the Eurozone will remain an essential task for this generation of leaders. No one should doubt we will continue to promote a policy mix of structural reforms, sound fiscal policies, and major investment for growth and jobs. We want to prevent and overcome economic shocks and fight asymmetries. And in this sense, EU has all the political and economic resources to advance towards a political union. Europe needs to have a fair and more sustainable development. Our welfare systems have to be up to date for the challenge of the digital society, and we need to work harder to make our union a social union. Additionally, huge economy of scale at EU level can be created in sectors like defense and securities and border control, as we have started joint work on the latter. Europe is costly when member states do not act together, pooling resources in key areas, particularly where no EU country alone can have a significant impact, is the real added value. Without a long-term approach on migration, based on the demographic changes in our society and on the developments in the world around us, EU will miss the opportunity to be a credible alternative to the politics of walls. We have to fight human trafficking, defend human rights, and protect our citizens and our borders. At the same time, we need to address the root causes for migration. And finally, we need to speed up decision-making processes. We need to do whatever it takes to bring back politics in Europe, which means knowing the causes of things and acting accordingly. We need to replenish the coffers of trust in our democracies. Only real and concrete democratic policies can do that. In the past 20 years, we have too often nurtured the idea that change of technological or economic nature could be treated as a neutral phenomenon to be dealt with through the tools of technical knowledge. This was a major mistake because unless the utility and appropriateness of change is shared across the population, change will eventually be seen with suspicion and rejected. I think the lack of attention to the consequences of change are at the core of the current crisis of trust we are experiences, experiencing across industrialized countries. A recent survey measured a steep increase in the number of countries where over 50% of the population does not trust the main institutions of business, media, and government. We need to understand that change is always contradictory and even if, as we all believe, global technological progress will deliver increased growth, jobs, and prosperity, the level of disruption that it currently entails has to be put at the forefront of public policy. Ladies and gentlemen, to close, I would like to acknowledge the role played by fellow Italians that live in the UK 
some of which I'm happy to see here today. Italians abroad are a constant source of pride and inspiration for those who live in Italy. Italian citizens live in the UK contribute to the prosperity not only of this country, but also of Europe, its economy and diversity. Whether working or studying in art or industry, you are paving the way for your future and our future. I am confident that the Brexit process will not affect the principle of reciprocity in the mobility of citizens and the recognitions of their rights. The relationship the, between the EU and the UK will hinge on the rights of individuals, citizens, and enterprises. As a young person, I loved British rock, and indeed I still do. One of my favorite bands, The Clash, The Clash, had this tune titled London Calling. I was thinking about it this morning on the plane. I am sure that also Paris Calling, Berlin Calling, Rome Calling will still be played in our continent. These cities and all the other marvelous European cities will continue to call attention as beacons of civilization all over the world. Our task as servants of our people is to answer their calls with the creative wisdom of politics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. That was a, a fantastic and very inspiring speech. Um, so I, as I said, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. So if you would like to ask a question, if you could just raise your hand. We do have people with mics around the room. So I've got a gentleman waving a uh, piece of paper and then somebody in the middle here with a, a top on and a hood and then a gentleman right at the back. So if we take those three, first of all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Would thank you. Like you. To, it might be easy if you could stand up, actually. Would that be okay? Thank it's, you. Uh, John Lloyd from the FT, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, you several times talked about integration uh, within Europe. Is it the case now that leaders like you and, and other country leaders are now discussing seriously an in what integration means? For example, a common finance ministry, a European finance ministry with real authority, a European military, a European army, and so on. Are these now? part of, are these now simply wishes, or are they part of a serious discussion leading to, as you suggested, something coming along soon? Thanks. Hi, I'm a student, MSc student here in economic history, and I was wondering, um, the problem with European politicians so far has been that they ascribe their successes to the national parties and their national governments, while all the failures are being blamed on Brussels. How do you, as a national politician, tend to solve that problem? Okay, thank you. Straight Good forward. afternoon, Mr. Gentiloni. Um, you have spoken about unity in the EU. Uh, I was just wondering, with the Trump administration trying to sort of destabilize unity, for example, by criticizing German economic policy and saying it is against the interest of other EU countries, how do you think the EU and other individual countries in the relationship with the US will have to deal with the situation? Uh, As you like. Uh, well, the, the, the question uh, raised by, uh, by John Lloyd, uh, are we serious uh, in the integration? Uh, my answer uh, could be, uh, we will see. Uh, I think we have a, as we say, a window of, uh, of opportunity. Why? Because the, uh, the Brexit decision and also what happened in the US election uh, could be a wake up call for EU. Obviously they are also a problem for EU, but they are very clearly a wake up call. Uh, my impression is that for a long time, in the last 10 to 15 years, we had this claim in, in our uh, European treaties uh, saying that we are marching towards an ever closer union. This is the claim of the treaties. Now we are beginning to understand that 
uh, marching towards an ever closer union at a 27 level, it's not easy. And that there are, by the way, already in the treaties, uh, potentialities to go forward among different member states. It is already the case, obviously, for Schengen, for the Eurozone. But my impression is that there is a stronger awareness on the fact that, that we can do more. I, I'll give you just an example, and then the reality will give you an answer. And I know that it is, it is an open challenge. Uh, my example is on security and defense. Uh, it is obvious that uh, when we hear from the other uh, side of the Atlantic saying that uh, there is perhaps a uh, less relevant commitment on NATO from the US side, and we will see, there is again a wake-up call with my uh, colleagues, uh, head of governments, I am frequently saying in these weeks that the, all the European process was born in the 50s, in the very years when I was born, uh, with the idea of a common defense, uh, the, the European community of defense. It was something in the 50s that was as you perhaps all know, by a French uh, position against. It was General uh, de Gaulle who was against this. And it is astonishing that now uh, there is an awareness, especially among the main member states of the EU, including France, on the fact that we have to go forward in security and defense. This is only an example, but obviously we are called to prove with the facts that this wake-up call is, uh, uh, is functioning. Uh, the, the second uh, question was, uh, if, if I remember well, uh, you, you can help me perhaps, on uh, if we are uh, seriously uh, tackling with our problems, or we are only blaming Brussels. Uh, well, blaming Brussels is, at a certain level, easy. Uh, and at a certain level, is also justified. Uh, because, you know, uh, it is easy, I admit, uh, because you, you are blaming a diverse entity, uh, not completely a democratic one. Uh, yes, there is the European Parliament, but the, the it is also uh, frequently also justified because of the uh, difficulties of the procedures of the, of the process. Personally, I am very reluctant to, at least to uh, exaggerate on uh, a general blaming of Brussels. I think we have the, we need to be specific and to be serious. Yes, we, from our Italian point of view, we can blame Brussels if we want to call it uh, Brussels, so the EU institutions on two or three very serious things that we have to change. For example, migration policies. Just think to the fact that Brussels had no migration policies until April, May 2015. It is unbelievable, but it is truly so. Our Prime Minister uh, Renzi uh, called for a EU summit, uh, I think it was in May 20, uh, 2015, after a shipwreck of a, uh, in the Libyan coast, and from this extraordinary summit was born a European agenda on migration for the first time. The first European agenda on migration is, uh, was born in June uh, the 10th, 
2015. So there is something mm, that doesn't work on this. And we are still running with the reality, running much faster than we are running. But many progress were made, so now we are asking to do more. Brussels, not Brussels, Europe, institutions on migration. We make some good steps. Last uh, week in Malta, I think, for example, we decided serious things. Uh, then there was a third uh, question that I don't remember. Trump effect. Trump. Oh, Trump, Trump. Trump. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, I think we will see. Uh, I always try to look to the optimistic side of the moon. Uh, where is the, obviously, the first answer is that we have our values, open society, uh, no, no to discrimination. Uh, we are demonstrating our values every day, by, by the way, in Italy and in other European countries. And we are very, very strong in defending those values, free trade, Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other side, and this is the optimistic side of the moon, again, wake up call for Europe. If it, it will be demonstrated through the idea that uh, from the other part of the Atlantic, we will have a more uh, uh, a politics more concentrated inside US. And it is not something completely new. It was um, in the last century we had frequent periods where US were concentrated in their own policies. Before Pearl Harbor, it was difficult to imagine a global commitment of the United States for several decades in the last century, even from democratic positions inside US. So if we will have, and we will see in the next weeks, it's a little bit short, the period we have of the new administration to understand clearly, but if we will have a weaker commitment at a global level from United States, is this or not an opportunity for Europe? We have an enormous opportunity. We are the first, trade superpower in the world. Just think to Latin America, for example, Mercosur. They are looking for trade agreement with Europe. So it's up to us to decide. If we want, there is perhaps a void to fill. And it is not only a danger, it is also an opportunity. Prime Minister, thank you very much. I know there are endless questions and we could keep, it, keep everybody here and you here actually for hours, but I realize that you have other, other places to go. So can I just ask everybody to thank the Prime Minister once again. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to have you here today and thank you so much for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.